Hello there, welcome to the booth here at Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. That is Ian Duke, I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. We've already done a booster draft for three rounds, now we've come to the last round of Modern. Let's head down to the feature match area for round number eight. Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Oath of the Gatewatch. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Ian Duke. We're ready for round number eight. Let's take a look at our players here. We've got on the left side there, you've got Jai Chin Tao. He is playing Eldrazi. We'll see what kind of flavor I'll have you look over the deck list. Sitting at 7-0, and oh, he's from the United States. On the other side of the table from Poland, Bartolomei Lewandowski, who is playing Obzon Company and also, of course, sitting at 7-0 and oh here. So let's get underway. Uh, this is relatively new deck with the Eldrazi deck here, Ian, one that we haven't seen a lot of cards from Oath of the Gatewatch. It's not often that we see a set impact modern this heavily, but it seems to have really kind of crafted its own little uh, corner here. Yeah, it's definitely true, and, and the, the, the whole deal here is um, is basically the lands. It's all about Eye of Ugin and Eldrazi Temple are just super powering these standard level cards into modern powerhouses. And it even added a few of those cards to the to the list. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. Your your reality smashers have been smashing a lot of opponents along with reality. We've also seen Thought Not Seer do great work. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are you getting here from Jai Chen here? So this is actually uh, quite an unusual version yes. of the Eldrazi deck. This is uh, a red blue version. And it's got some some interesting choices here. We see Eldrazi Sky Spawner. What? Uh, Vile Aggregate, Eldrazi Obligator. So this this is not the same as the uh, Channel Fireball version of the deck that we've seen in previous feature match rounds. Now that being said, it is using some of the same synergies we see in Eldrazi Temple on the battlefield. That's right. Yep. So again, these these powerful lands here sort of form the basis for the Eldrazi the, uh, category of decks. And then there's a bunch of different ways you can take it and this particular one is, is blue-red and lower to the ground. Now, what about on Bartholomew's side? Abzan Company is a deck that did exist before, and, you know, people will, will constantly sort of tweak where they want it to be, but what's the core of the deck? What, it, what, what is this deck all about? So I kind of view it in some ways as a descendant of the, uh, the Birthing Pot decks from way back in the day. Uh, you've got, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a green-white creature deck at base um, with a lot of utility creatures, things like Wall of Roots, uh, you know, Scavenging Ooze, Spellskite, Kasali Pride Mage, all these different, um, you know, creatures with interesting abilities, and then Collected Company is kind of what glues it all together along with Court of Calling, so you have a good chance of finding just the creatures that you need for a given matchup. So I, I'd call it like a versatile mid-range creature deck. Okay. With combo finishes. Yes. So yeah. in the meantime, what we have on the battlefield here is, yes, that is an Eldrazi Sky Spawner and Friend. That was last turn. This turn, it's Thought Not Seer on turn three, which is going to take away Court of Calling and let the uh, Eldrazi Sky Spawner bash for a turn two. On the other side of the table for Lewandowski, well, he's assembled a Kitchen Finks and a Scavenging News as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just grab your pen, so I wasn't sure no, what you were doing. I just crossed the oh, okay. card that she knew. Yep. Makes sense. How many cards do you have? Four. Four. Well, I'll take one. Eighteen. Eighteen? Okay. I think we're going to see this collected company main phase here. You know, Bartolome is probably looking at the other side and not really quite knowing exactly what's going on. When you are 7-0 and oh on day one of the Pro Tour, by the way, he hit nicely here. An Avon Mind Sensor and a Kitchen Finks, and, and your opponent plays a turn two Eldrazi Sky Spawner. That's got to raise some question marks in your head about you know, maybe they're playing counter spells. Yeah. Who knows? And you're just gonna make sure to to get that. Uh, collect or the maybe they down. just pulled their draft deck out of the pocket <laughs> instead. <laughs> I was just thinking. Um, but no, I mean both these decks here at seven zero, quite powerful to be sure. Um, yeah, really curious to see this blue red Eldrazi deck in action. I saw it a little bit as I was walking around. Uh, the tournament floor in earlier rounds, and it definitely caught my eye. So awesome to see it here succeeding at the feature match table. Gosh, another thought not seer here for Tao. Yeah, what's 
He's going to see a spell skite and a wall of roots. He's going to take away the spell skite here. Yeah, Thought Not Seer really the card that makes the Eldrazi deck more than just huge monsters for cheap mana cost. This is what, oh. what gives the deck interaction. Look there, at that top deck from Bartolome. He finds a collected company. Immediately fires it off once again while Tau is still top, uh, tapped out. Okay. Uh oh. Not a huge hit there, but there is Malira, Silvok Outcast. I mean, he's getting towards huge hit range. He just needs to find a, a sacrifice, sacrifice outlet. outlet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for those who haven't seen it, Malira um, prevents counters from being placed on creatures you control. And that, in combination with the persist ability of Kitchen Finks, when Kitchen Finks dies, it jumps back to the battlefield with a minus one, minus one counter on it. But since it can't have minus one, minus one counters placed on it, it just comes back in its original form. So if you have a way to sacrifice the Kitchen Finks over and over again, you can actually gain an arbitrary, arbitrarily large amount of life. What number would you choose? Oh, I don't know, a million-ish? Jeez, you aim a little lower than I do. Okay, what do you have in mind? 47 trillion. Okay, that's a very specific large number. Yeah. Strategic reasons for that. All right, Vile Aggregate here, too. So, yeah, well, the best draft deck that I ever did in BFZ is almost completed. We're one clutch <laughs> of currents away here. And this is a really cool deck. Vile Aggregate's huge here. It's a 5-5 five five with Trample for three mana here, and he only had to tap two lands to cast it. Okay, there's Liliana. Do you mind if I take it off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. At least you have the double sleeved. Tao wants to make sure that he remembers exactly One card? what Liliana does here. Lewandowski still just one step away. Now, you've had a chance to browse the deck list a little bit here. If Lewandowski <coughs> does get to the point where he can gain, you know, between a million and 47 trillion life, uh, is that game over? Like, can Tau actually win via any other means, or is that going to do it? No, he cannot win via any other means. Not okay. with his main deck here, at the very least. All right, so Lewandowski knows exactly what he needs to do here. He needs to find a way to search up Eviscerous here. Yep, that could be Court of Calling, could be another collected company, could be naturally drawing it. So quite a few ways to find that. In the meantime, oh, sorry. he's got the, the ground go yeah, shored up fairly well here with all these kitchen things. I mean, even uh, without the sacrifice piece of the engine here, he does just still have essentially immortal kitchen things. So those are going to hold off the ground super well. He even sent one of them in. It looks like he's trying to get his Liliana transformed here. You can take a look at the... Uh, what Tao was looking at, Liliana Defiant Necromancer, after she gets transformed there. Assuming that Lewandowski l would like to get Liliana transformed and just start getting cards out of Tao's hand. Lewandowski has now transformed Liliana. That's also given him a 2-2 zombie in addition to the pair of Kitchen Finks, the Scavenging News, and the Malira that he already had on board. The Even Mind Sensor also does get in for a couple of damage, and it's still around. 16 apiece for our players. Looking to stay undefeated here on day one, and it's a wall of roots. And here we go. Lewandowski's going to start working on the, uh, the hand of Tau. He's got three cards in hand going down to one. Couldn't quite see what he discarded there. It was an Eldrazi Obligator. Ah. Yeah, this, this board state has gotten seriously cramped for a card like that to, to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense why he would discard it. And let's see what Tau finds here. Lewandowski has maneuvered himself into a beautiful position here. He is really under no pressure whatsoever. Just needs to find his combo. 
And I can tell you that on our King of the Hill table, Jason Chung just keeps chugging here. The New Zealander with his Blue Moon deck is up a game over Alan Wu and Affinity. Jason did get paired down this round as Alan's on 6-1 and one record, while Jason has yet to lose today. Great run. He seems to be playing excellent magic today as well with that Blue Moon and he even 3-0 his draft. So fantastic start for Jason. Great stuff. This is a drowner of hope now. Ian, okay. what the heck? <laughs> this really is just the best draft deck I've ever had at a battle for Seneca. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> this deck is sweet. So we'll go ahead and bring that up for you all. So big 5-5 five, five Eldrazi it comes with a couple scions, and you can sacrifice a sign to tap a creature. So, yeah, it's potentially something that could allow Judge and Tao to break through. If he's able to maybe make some more scions or find a second drowner of hope or something like that in the meantime he's he's had enough sitting around and staring at each other he's just going to attack with most of his creatures here yeah i'm not totally sure what to make of this attack i mean i think those kitchen things jump in the way of thought not seers pretty readily yeah and end up gaining lewandowski life in the process yeah i mean the, the vile aggregate is big so and it has trample so that's something to take into consideration When you asked before, is there a way for Judge and Tao to win against infinite life? I guess technically he could ingest enough cards off mm. of Lewandowski's deck, but yeah. obviously yeah. a pretty big long shot there. Yeah, I like your original answer. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the blocks. The Vile Aggregate is massive. It's nine power. So one tricky thing here is with the multi-blocks using the Kitchen Finks, Judge and Tao could just decline to kill the Kitchen Finks, and actually I'm sure he will do that uh, to prevent them from coming back and gaining life. So it's uh, actually a somewhat risky set of blocks among possible blocks here. Although that does allow... Lewandowski to draw two cards off the Thought Not Seers, getting maybe ever closer to a Viscera Seer or a way to find it. Yeah. Oh, so actually a little bit of confusion over whether damage was actually assigned to the Kitchen Finks or not. So. Uh, we just quickly would like to check this deck because you played double stage. Is okay? Yes, sure. Okay, well, the, 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 the judges are doing a deck check, which is separate from what they were talking about before, but, but you were right, Ian. Mm -hmm. There wasn't uh, defined yet whether all the damage was going to go on one of the creatures or the other, so they're going to get that sorted out yes. after the fact. My opponent attacked with double photon seers. Yep. And uh, I blocked with uh, Kitchen things, Kitchen things, uh, and, a token, yeah. and a token, and this one is counter. Yep. This was how... Yep. One, two, one, two, one, two, all right, yeah. Yeah, and we let damage resolve. We let damage, he, damage resolve, but he didn't say that he's assigning all the damage to the zombie. So does he kill, if we let the damage resolve, uh, is it by default that he kills the zombie and the kitchen things? Cause uh, so you, you, you both resolve damage without, yes. without splitting yes. anything? And, I, and I, he said draw two cards, and I, I put these two away. And in the meantime, you, you want to take my deck yes. away. And I said, and I'm gonna gain two because you apparently killed my kitchen things. Okay, I didn't hear. I didn't hear that part. Yeah. So the default is generally da damage will carry over okay. unless mm -hmm. specifically assigned. That's fine. Okay, so I'm gonna. Okay, so that was a quick resolution to that. Now the the main thing that happened though that turn in was that Liliana died. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what Tao was going for with that attack. Oh, I see. Interesting. So the the. Um, Vile Aggregate was aimed at Liliana. Though. That's correct. Okay. Very good. Yep. We're good. Okay. So Planeswalker down, but it did cost Jach and Tao very yep. dearly. He yep. lost two 4-4s four in that transaction, and as it turns out, Lewandowski also got to gain four life. Yep. And draw two, uh, two cards off the Thought Nuts Indeed. I'm at 19, you're at 16. Is that correct? 19, 16. Yes, 
So a bit of a desperation attack there. I had actually assumed the vile aggregate was uh, was going to deal damage oh. to Lewandowski himself. There's a nice draw. Oh, what's this? Gavany Township. Oh yeah, that's going to be good. That that's an alternate win condition that Lewandowski can use because he does find himself often in a position where he's just dumped a bunch of kind of eh creatures on the battlefield like he has now. We know he's one draw step away from comboing off, but even if that doesn't happen, he can now just start using the Gavany Township, and it does not take long. That's the thing about that card that maybe wasn't obvious when it first came out a few years ago, is that it takes just an activation or two, and all of a sudden your, your team is massive. Yeah, it's a super powerful card. Yeah. Lewandowski passes the turn back to Tau after getting in for two damage with his Aven Mind Sensor, and... Yeah, Tau is way up against it here. I don't know how he gets out of this mess. I, I think Tau's deck is, is designed to kind of get out to a quick start using the lands that you mentioned and yeah. then capitalize on it. And he's found himself in a spot where he's quite a bit behind. I, I don't think his deck has the tools to get out of it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, his deck is virtually all creatures. So once he's gotten a spot where his creatures can't attack profitably, there's like not really much else to draw to in his deck. I mean... Um, Drowner of Hope gives him a little bit of control over the, over the battlefield um, in terms of being able to tap creatures, but uh, it is definitely not looking great here for Jesh and Tau. Okay, so Township just got activated on Tau's turn on his end step. He played endless one. Oh, because you have the negatives. Okay, all right. Can we use the separate? Or, um, I can we're going to have mostly scale. positives, correct? Uh, mostly positives. Yeah, let's use can. these for the positives and let's convert that to the negative. You can plus okay, three sure. of the blue ones so for the minus or minus one. Yeah. Or, or the red, or, or the red die, whatever. These are negative. Yep. And positive one. Okay. One. You can hear they're just making sure that everything's clear on the board state as far as which are plus one, plus one counters sure there and which ones are on the My wall turn. of roots. Different type of counter. And this is where things get out of hand for Lewandowski. I mean, he just needs to activate this uh, this township a turn or two more, and the whole thing will be done. All right, we've also got another matchup from uh, from from our table C, which features Yelger Vigersma at five and two against Martin Clement, also at five and two, and Yelger's up a game there. He's playing Jeskai Control. Clement's on Storm. Oh, interesting. I haven't seen Storm today yet, but yep. there we go. And Lewandowski is going to remain patient since he still doesn't have great attacks on the ground and just peck in there with the now 3-3 Mind Sensor. Does not activate his Township. You'll often see players do that in this scenario so he gets in an extra point of damage if that's what his plan is anyway, but he decides not to. Tao's looking at the board state. Trying to figure out how to get out of this mess. Blocks. You're gonna dismember your birds. Okay. Well, he's fighting the good fight here, that's so for I sure. He attacks seven. with the 2 1 Eldrazi Sky Spawner to try to bring Bartholomew down from 20 to 18. And he's gonna have to use a full on dismember just to kill a Birds of Paradise to get that damage through. We've also got a game three on our back table match. That's Andrew Cunio versus Marco Camaluzzi, both again at five and two. And uh, they're going to game three. So we'll get a decider on that. And Tao's being very helpful. Though this could definitely be the last turn for him. And it's an Eldrazi Sky Spawner there for, for Tao at the top. Does have a lot of creatures. Hmm. I am seven. So Tao used the dismember to take out the Birds of Paradise. I can only assume his plan 
is to start using the Drowner of Hope to tap the Aven Mind Sensor and hope he can get through for four points in the air each turn. Um, seems unlikely that that's a path to victory, but it might be the best that he has here. Uh, meanwhile, Lewandowski's board just growing out of control with that Gavany Township. And it's sort of just a matter of time before he decides to start committing to attacking. That guy's humongous. <clears throat> <laughs> Tau is correct. It looks like uh, Bartolome is content to just keep uh, tacking in there with his flyer. No good attacks yet on the ground for him. Two cards. Three. Two. two. How big is this guy right now? Uh, he's, he's a 2-2. 2-2? That's a nice round number. <laughs> okay, no blocks. Take four. Go to three. Take four, go to three, and that thing, he decides not to block it, and there's a Birds of Paradise added to the board here as well. See if Tao's ready to pack it in here or not. Tao is running the full amount of Drowner Hopes. <laughs> He's got the full four. Going to play a Shivan Reef and potentially line up a couple of attacks here, though. He's got to be careful. The Mind Sensor is lethal. He's going to get in for a couple to drop Lewandowski down to 15. Yeah, I mean, Drowner of Hope can hold off that even Mind Sensor for a few turns here. Yeah, looks like he's got some three, three turns. Yep. Although uh, Birds of Paradise is going to start growing into a lethal threat pretty quickly as well. Another update from our back tables. Uh, Jason Chung versus Alan Wu. Alan Wu picks up game two to force game three against Jason. So game three's on tables B and D. We're in game one here still. Both of these players sitting undefeated here at the Pro Tour. Lewandowski's still deciding if it's going to be time for him to just send the team in. At some point, he can attack with so many lethal threats that he just forces Tao to chump block his board away and maybe even just get in for lethal. But, I, you know, I don't really see what the hurry is for Lewandowski either. I, why take a risk, right? No, he's going to let him declare attackers here. Yes, sir. Thank you. When I declare all of them, I'll probably. Thank you. Still. So he's got six lethal attackers and a non-lethal attacker here. Can. Gobble up three of the Eldrazi Scions with those, leaving three other lethal attackers. Okay, this, is my attack. this is my attack. Remember, he still has one activation available on that uh, Gavany Township, too.
Taos lining up blocks. He has not given up on this thing yet. I did see in the chat a few people were wondering if Tao has access to all his dust. He does not. Doesn't have it in the main deck, and this is game one. He also doesn't have it in his sideboard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he definitely seems very all in on the play a bunch of creatures quickly, attack with them, hope it's good enough, kind of mm -hmm. a game plan. He's definitely looking to smash some realities, too. Yeah, I like this deck. I think it's really cool. Yeah, oh yeah, it's for, for sure it's cool. But I don't think that Tao is going to find his way out of this mess. <clears throat> so combat damage resolving here. Malira does die, but uh, Kitchen Finks get to come back. But wait, there's more, says Lewandowski. What else do you got? It's an eternal witness. And he's just going to go ahead and get the collected company back, play a land, and shift the turn back. And I assume that this will be the last turn of the game as Tao draws his card and concedes. So Bartolome Lewandowski takes game one here in our main feature match. Meanwhile, we've had a bunch of games finish on our side ones. We'll get back to those after these messages. Outfit your magic collection with the newest Oath of the Gatewatch accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, play mats, and portfolios of your favorite magic artwork at ultrapro.com. Put your game to the test at a Grand Prix. These open tournaments feature the best players in your region as well as top magic pros from around the world. Upcoming Grand Prix include Houston, Melbourne, Bologna, Detroit, Washington DC, and Paris. Visit magic.wizards.com slash Grand Prix for a complete schedule. And welcome back to the feature match area here in Atlanta. So we do have uh, a winner on our back table there. Camaluzzi, Marco Camaluzzi from Italy has defeated Andrew Cuneo. You can see uh, Cuneo just exiting the uh, feature match area there to go to six and two. And Cuneo is going to have to settle for five and three day one. All right, let's jump down to Martin Clement versus Yelger Vigersma. Now, Yelger was up a game last we heard. It looks like that's still the case. Whoa! So we came just in time, Ian. <laughs> Empty the Warrant has just resolved with storm count of seven. So we saw 14 right. goblins. That'll do it. And Yelger says, I've seen enough. We'll get a game three. Now... We're going to jump back over to our far table. That's the King of the Hill table, where we have Jason Chung from New Zealand playing Blue Moon at 7-0 and in Game 3 against Alan Wu of the United States playing Affinity. And this should be an exciting one, depending on how many electrolyzes we see out of the uh, Blue Moon deck here. Four mana available here for Jason Chung at 16 life as he passes back to Alan Wu, who's got a cranial plating, an ornithopter, and a memnite. He's also got a pair of Blink Moth Nexuses at the ready. We will also note that there's already a cranial plating in the graveyard for Alan, as well as an ornithopter. And Alan's going to go ahead and equip Cranial Plating to the Ornithopter, attack with both of his creatures, so. <clears throat> so he's currently taking four damage if nothing happens. And Alan Wu has passed priority back to Chung, so Chung's going to have to make a decision here. He says, sure, taking it. He goes down to 12. 
I, I did see that Jason has a lightning bolt in his hand. Yep, looks like Jason's hand was lightning bolt. Um, I would assume cryptic in there. command, yeah, yeah and electrolyze. Oh, wow. electrolyze. Yeah, a card that's been an all-star for him so far this weekend. Uh, yeah, it looks like he's just keeping the cryptic command up. Uh, four damage is not too much to take at this stage of the game. Cryptic command ensures that there won't be a problematic second main phase, you know, etch champion or follow up cranial plating or yeah. arcbound ravager, something along those lines. In this case, it's thought cast, and he is going to just cut him off of it. Oh, and he draws a snapcaster Ooh, yes. mage here too. So this could definitely be the turning point in the match here towards Jason Chung. He finds a burst lightning off the top of his library as well. So he's got answers to everything on board. Everything. Yeah. Like. Even the lands, <laughs> he, he can handle those too. Yeah, it actually ends up being super good for Jason Chung if Alan Wu activates lands this turn. Indeed. All right, why don't we hang out here? You can see that we are front table has started again but that last game went pretty long and you know if Tao wins this one we're going to get a game three anyway and he's the one that can have the really quick start so I think we stay here and let's see if Jason Chung or Alan Wu are going to be undefeated excuse me if Jason Chung can be undefeated game one Alan Wu has already taken a loss with his affinity deck but if he can stay with just the one loss on his record to end the day yeah, this game's looking super interesting, Marshall. I'm really eager to see how combat plays out on this turn. Yeah, for those of you that, at stake. Yeah, for sure. For those of you that want to keep up on the Tao and Lewandowski, you can see it on the upper right-hand side of your screen as well. Okay, attack, pass Same priority. Four, right? It's at four, but now this is starting to get to the point where Jason's going to want to start using his removal spells, and he's going to use one. Burst Lightning to take down the Ornithopter. That was the one that was equipped with Cranial Plating. So this reduces the total damage here from four to one. And since he has two Glimmer Voids, he's actually able to equip the Cranial Plating using Double Black at instant speed here to add an extra couple of damage and get Jason down to nine. Now this is a big turn here because here's an Arcbound Ravager. It's on the stack. You can see Jason being super patient here, just willing to take some damage and keep his options open for uh, second main phase or the end of the turn. And, and sure he's enough, just going to mana leak here. Yeah. I like that play a lot from Jason. You know, I've seen a lot of players think, well, I've got some good removal spells. I'll let them have their Ravager, and it go horribly terrible for them. Now, all of a sudden, all of his burn spells are still very alive. Ooh, wow. Is that Vandalize? It's Vandal Blast. Or Vandal Blast, excuse yeah, me? Yeah, Overloaded. So that's oh. destroying, destroying all of uh, Alan Wu's artifacts, and that'll make oh. the Glimmer Voids die as a result. So oh, huge play What there. a blowout for Jason. All right, you know what? Why don't we go back to our main match? I, I, I feel confident that Jason Chung is going to be able to close this one out. We will update you as that happens, but that Vandal Blast... That had to be the nails Monster. in the coffin for Wu. Yeah. What a huge play. He destroyed yeah. two, two artifacts and two lands with one card. Wow, Jason Chung really came to play today. That was gross. Okay, so as we join our main match here, remember Lewandowski won that prolonged game one with that huge board state. And there's a Viscerous here that he could have used at pretty much any point during the course of that game. But couldn't find. And it looks like he's passed a turn back to Tao, who has a nice start here with a pair of Vile Aggregates and an Eldrazi Sky Spawner. So those are both four fives. Ah, here's a Ruination Guide as well. So this acts as a Lord for him. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see, I'm assuming, a Collected Company here. He's going to crack a fetch land, and that's going to give him the fourth, the fourth mana here. That also can pump up that elemental token by another couple. I really like the inclusion of Cavern of Souls in, uh, in Tao's deck, naming, as I'm sure, Eldrazi. Eldrazi? Like I like that person. a lot. Yeah, that's really cool. All right, so what does Lewandowski hit? 
Oh, no. He only hit one card. It's not bad. Still thinking before blocks. Sure. So, so this is in the middle of Tao's attack. Lewandowski just thinking before blocks here. Yeah, I think he wanted to try to get his, his already elemental token as big as possible, or at least know how big it was going to be before going to blocks. And we did get an update that Jason Chung did win that, that match that we just left earlier after that sick, sick Vandal Blast. And I'm going to need you to choose your blockers. I just sucked the first Oh, I, I didn't see. I'm sorry. So just give me a second. So it looks like Voice of Resurgence was sacrificed there in addition before blockers getting the scry off the Viscera Seer. Are you conceding? Yes. Oh, okay. okay, and looks like Lewandowski just decides to concede. Yeah, he didn't find what he needed there, and he said, I don't have any outs, and that's going to do it. So Tao picks up game two. That was a little more what he was thinking, I think, when he For sat sure. down here. You know, th that's the kind of game he wants to play. The prolonged attrition game doesn't seem to be what he wants to do. Yeah, from what we've seen out of these Eldrazi decks, they definitely rely on getting getting a strong start, curving out well, getting a lot of momentum. Uh, don't do as well in the long, protracted games. All right, so let's look over and see what Yelger, Vigersma, and Martin Clement are up to here as they are our last non-main match going. Sure. And we've got some business here. So Martin, remember, is on Storm. Last game he made was it 14 goblins? Yep, that empty, was empty the that did the trick right there. In the meantime, Yelger Vigersma is playing Jeskai Control. Yeah, this is uh, the same or a similar list to what we saw Antonino De Rosa playing in an earlier feature match. Which makes sense, right? They they did uh, test, test together, together yeah, mm -hmm. on Pantheon. So. And right now we came just in time because Yelger has lethal Snapcasters on the battlefield here, and Martin's got to do something immediately or he's just going to die to combat damage on the ground here. Is this going to be a Goblin Electromancer? No, it is not. It is a Phoretic, phoretic Ritual, and it is going to get countered by Spell Snare, and that might just be all she wrote here. I see a Steam Vents in hand for, for Clement, but if he plays it, he's going to go down to two and make either Snapcaster lethal. Can he kill them? Yes. Yes, he can. All right. <laughs> creative use of grape shot. There. Yeah, so he's going to grape shot to do one to Vigersma and also one to each of the Snapcasters. Oh, it's lightning a lightning bolt. bolt off the top for <laughs> Yelger. All right. Just in it. time, and that will do it. So no, no, no big stress there for Yelger. He just immediately finds the bolt, and he improves to six and two. He's going to send Martin Clement down to five and three on the records as they both make their way out of the building and into day two tomorrow, which leaves, of course, just our main match, which is, I got to say, the most interesting matchup down there, this crazy Eldrazi deck from uh, Jai Chin Tao, and then uh, a really solid-looking Abzan company build here from Bartolome Lewandowski. He's been doing very well with it, and again, this match, super important. Both of these players are 7-0 right now, and looking to play for undefeated overnight at the Pro Tour, which is a huge deal. And just so you know, they've got 12 minutes left on the clock, which, which is plenty. You know, that first game was very long. Second game was not. And, and in this game, we will see Lewandowski back on the play, which mm. is a huge deal for uh, a creature deck that starts with turn one accelerants like Noble Hierarch or Birds of Paradise. Oh, yeah, great point. Some things to consider as well is that, you know, uh, Tao's deck is very proactive. He's really looking to keep you on your heels and just pound you with these colorless Eldrazi creatures. In the meantime, Lewandowski can play the value game, but he also can just gain infinite life out of nowhere. And if he does so, I don't think the Tau's going to have much of a game plan. And there it is, Birds of Paradise on turn one, just like you described a minute ago, these creature-based mana accelerators. 
can really put you ahead. Yeah, Lewandowski's hand is looking really nice there. He's got collected company for next turn into a court of calling to find whatever he needs. Uh, there's a decent chance he could put together uh, an infinite combo within the next couple turns here. So we will see. Did and I just... also catch a... Was that a slaughter pact in his hand? What was that? It is a slaughter pact, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. A nice, efficient way to deal with uh, big Eldrazi, for sure. Here comes Collected Company. Can he find some combo pieces? Yes, he found one. He did find one, but he th there's three that he needs, and he's only got one so far. He doesn't hit a land drop for the turn, but he does find some Birds of Paradise, which do just fine. And here it is. Reality Smasher. Reality Smasher. Now, this is the way that Tau can start getting a really fast clock going and just crushing Lewandowski's life total here with a 5-5 five, five trample haste. But you know what? Slaughter Pact. That is going to take care of Reality Smasher. Yeah, it's a little bit of a painful Slaughter Pact, though. It does uh, cause the discard trigger from Reality Smasher as well as the upkeep payment. Mm -hmm. That was an Orzov Pontiff that hit the board, I believe. Which actually looks really good in this matchup. Yeah, it's good at taking up those Scion tokens. And Sky Spawners. And Sky, yeah, Sky yeah, Spawners too. Yeah. But we haven't seen any of those yet for Tau, so, uh, so Lewandowski decides to discard it to the Reality Smasher trigger. And there's a Drowner of Hope. So a nice follow-up play here for Tau, looking to try to keep the pressure on Lewandowski as much as possible. And thinks is going to rumble. Right into the old 5 5 Drowner, I hope. Hmm. Somewhat interesting attack there. I agree. Could be representing, you know, Cord into something tricky here. I mean, could be like a Cord into a Liliana that could trigger in the middle of combat. Looks like no, just getting the trigger on the Kitchen Finks. Ah, Murderous Red Cap post combat. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. Nice. So Murderous Red Cap is going to do two damage to the Drowner and finish it off, leaving Tau with just the two Eldrazi Scions here. And he needs to add something back to the board right away. And hey, how about another Drowner of Hope? That will work. And you can see why Drowner of Hope is good in these scenarios as well, right? Because now if he has like a Ruination Guide, you know, all of a sudden he's got what, 6, 10, 12, you know, damage. Yeah, or even just like another Reality Smasher or Vile Aggregate, and then he starts tactically tapping down creatures with science. Could be a way to, to piece apart uh, Lewandowski's board and just continue pressuring through with damage. Totally. So Court of Calling and Kitchen Finks in hand, plus whatever Lewandowski picked up for the turn. Gives him a lot of options for sure. He's not quite yet at uh, combo potential, but... Not far off either with the cord. We might see him just hold on to that cord and see which of his combo pieces he draws naturally first yes. and then getting the third one with the cord. Does hold a lot more value assuming that his life total isn't under assault or he doesn't need to deal with something immediately. Which seems to be the case right now. Yeah, but all in all, this is anyone's game. I could definitely see this going either direction. Uh, Jia, Chen Tao, Jia Chen Tao's mana is uh, in full form now, so he can really start deploying th threats super quickly. Although nothing with that turn. So I have to wonder if he's uh, running out of gas a little bit. Maybe just sitting on some lands in hand. I mean, can he get up to enough mana to start activating that Eye of Ugin? <laughs> That's actually interesting. <laughs> I hadn't even really thought about it. Some, something you don't really see that often outside of, you know, Ursatron. Yeah. But it is technically possible in these Eldrazi decks. He, I mean, he could technically do it now. He would cost him some Scions. Yep. But yeah, I guess in theory you could start chaining out some Drowners of Hope or something like that. Exactly. In the meantime, there is an end of turn cord here getting Eternal Witness. And I'm assuming that bought back a Collected Company? Yeah, the back Pontiff the came Pontiff, back. Actually, okay, yeah, well, so. I bet you we will see an Eye of Ugin activation now. <laughs> Since he's just going to lose those anyway. Apparently doesn't have anything else to spend it on. Uh, yeah. Second night, please. Okay. <laughs> 
He is going to use his eye of Ugin. I think he needed. I think he might need to tap that steam vents there, huh? Uh, it was four cyan tokens and three lands. Yeah. Is that enough? I have Ugin. I think it's seven. Yes, tap, yes, right? yes, yes. Sorry, it yeah. is enough. My bad. So he's all good there. And what did he get? I'm assuming a drowner, I hope. Yeah. I think that's his best option. Yeah, it's just his biggest, beefiest Eldrazi oh, no. he's got yeah. there. He's not packing Desolation Twins or Ulamogs or anything like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, that would be great, you know, that just having like one Ulamog to, in these situations, but it just costs him so much when he draws it. Yeah, for sure. So he's going to, I mean, this is still a sweet turn, right? Drowner of Hope and Vile Aggregate? Yeah, it's fairly sweet. Maybe not sweet enough. Full Mage, Mage, Mage takes out Eye of Ugin before it can start repeatedly activating, so that's pretty important there. Yeah, just pokes him in the eye. <laughs> That's a gemstone caverns? <laughs> Take a look at what that does over there. Ooh, collected company off the top. That's great. Let's see what we get. Kitchen Finks and another Fulminator Mage. You're at 27. I imagine at this point, Fulminator Mage just waits for the next Eye of Ugin to appear. It's not too much point in taking out an Eldrazi Temple or anything like that. How many cards do they have? I have two. He's got so much mana available. Destroy the temple? Yeah, he's going to do it anyway. Yeah, maybe just it is day one of the Pro Tour. Players don't have each other's deck lists like we do. So Great maybe point. thinking about maybe the Ulamog is going to come out or something totally. like that. Totally. And that is a problem for Lewandowski. I mean, if, if Ulamog were to start getting recurred or something, oh yeah, it gets really bad really fast. And of course, the oh. exile part is really important too, so. All right, so these players have five and a half minutes. Time has been called in the round for the main floor, but our feature match usually takes a couple of extra minutes. So <clears throat> they've got five and a half. So Relic of Progenitus comes down for Tau here starts attacking Lewandowski's graveyard. That's important. It's super important. It's going to shut off any kind of uh, Malira combo shenanigans. And it's going to make it a lot harder for Lewandowski to actually close out the game. So at this point, Lewandowski, you know, he, he wants to see something like a Gavany Township so he can just start getting that incremental advantage turn after turn. Jeez, there's another Drowner of Hope here. Yeah, that's starting to get a little bit scary. It's the fourth one of the game. Because remember, each scion represents tapping a creature, and if enough scions get on the battlefield, it could just be, you know, tap your team, attack with three Drowners of Hope, maybe a Vile Aggregate yeah. or something like that. I mean, that. how big is that Vile Aggregate right now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's eight power. Can I read the of Pontiff? Yes, sure. He wants to read the Pontiff for the hunt. Haunt is historically one of the more kind of complex mm -hmm. mechanics, so it's not uncommon to have people double check about what it actually does, how it actually works. And it looks like he has decided to, in fact, attack with Vile Aggregate. You can sense a little bit of tension there from Lewandowski as he wants to make sure that the uh, the game finishes. He's going to crack a fetch land.
Yeah, so this is a little bit tricky and dangerous here. Um, this attack is going to potentially let that Pontiff die, and it could maybe haunt a wall of roots, which then Lewandowski could set up with um, putting enough minus one, minus zero, minus one counters on it that he could actually trigger the Pontiff at instant speed. Mm -hmm. So what happened there was Tao had Dismember in his hand, and he took out the Kitchen Finks before damage to try to get in a big chunk. Okay, so this is Tao just trying to brute force his way through this. Uh, he is yeah. through this board, which is really tough with all these persist creatures and life gain going on here. Okay, looks like the Pontiff is haunting the Kitchen Finks. Oh, but there's, there's a, a response. response. He's going to get that one dismembered too. Yep. So that sort of fizzles the haunt trigger there. Okay, and that lets. Well, let's a vile aggregate stay big thanks to those scions. Okay, so that attack actually worked out well, pretty uh, pretty well for Tau. He had to use two dismembers to do it, but he it's made down some to eleven. Headway. End step. He's going to activate it, not pay any mana. So relic of progenitus is just going to take like a random card. Uh, all right, let's check out your hand. It looks like it's going to be a thought not seer based on that statement. And he does check out his hand, though it's just a forest. Can he keep attacking? Remember, Tao's the one who's down to 11 here, too. Yeah, now that vile aggregate is getting super dangerous. It really is. And especially, like you mentioned, the, the Drowner of Hope able to, like, pick off certain blockers just for a turn and make sure that he can't p compile enough, uh, you know, power to actually kill the thing. Yep. Yeah, so I think Lewandowski wisely is going to use this as his, sort of his last opportunity to actually kill the vile aggregate. Uh, the aggregate's so dangerous because it, not only is its power super high, but it has trample as well. Mm. Tau's down to seven. He's got to be careful not to just die on the crack back here. Yeah, this is turning into a surprisingly tight game. I, I thought Lewandowski was way ahead based on the way uh, this game played out in the early turns. But uh, Tau's doing a good job, you know, just sticking, sticking with it and just brute forcing his way through all these uh, literally uh, persistent creatures. We're down around 30 seconds left uh, in play for these two gentlemen as well, so we, we will be hitting extra turns shortly. But these is huge chunks of damage hitting Lewandowski. He ingests away a path. And with his trigger on the stack for Persist, Tau's also going to take that opportunity to crack the Relic. That means that the Kitchen Finks does not come back. And look at this board state now. Look at this. Wow. <laughs> That really turned around fast. And that's oh, it. man. And Zhao Chen Tao stays undefeated with his crazy Eldrazi deck. 8 and 0, oh, day one of the Pro Tour. Lewandowski's going to have to settle for a rock solid 7 and 1 start, though. Great stuff from both of these, but I got to say, crazy to see this deck playing these, these yeah. cards I played in Limited last night. <laughs> that's right. In modern. Yeah. And he's just smashing everybody with it, 8 and 0. Oh. Pretty awesome stuff there. Yeah, that was really fun and a really cool look at Modern and some of the things that you can do in it. I mean, there's still unexplored space, and every set that comes out at least gives you the opportunity to look into that space. And we can see that uh, sometimes you look in places you wouldn't necessarily expect, and you find something pretty sweet. Yeah, it's definitely true. Yeah, and uh, Jai Chintao, again, he is now 8-0, and oh, one of our undefeated players here on day one. So fantastic work by him. And, uh, again, Lewandowski is going to have to settle for a seven and one, which losing, I'm sure the last round of the PT, he's gonna walk out like, ugh, you know, but yeah, seven and one. There's a little one. bit of that. Seven and one, still yeah. awesome. He's in great yeah. shape for potentially making top eight, so good luck right. to him. Um, also, you know, down in the feature match area, you know, we had uh, Jason Chung versus Alan Wu. We had Martin Clement and Yelger Vigersma down there, and uh, a whole lot of other stuff. All right, a lot going on in the tournament. For a recap here, let's send it over to Rich and the news desk. Thanks so much uh, to the boys in the booth there, bringing you all the action, Marshall and Ian Duke there. Um, so we're closing in on the end of day one. We'll get you final standings and we'll set you up for day two in just a little bit. But we've got some tremendous players who've had terrific days at the office, uh, so to speak. And the first of those at seven and one from the Pantheon. He's in the Hall of Fame and it's no surprise. Here comes Brian David Marshall with William Jensen. Tell me, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier this week, yep. and you, you guys were like, 
had a couple decks that you were thinking about. How did the final days of prep go leading into this event? Like, how did you guys hone in on what you were all going to play? Ultimately, you know, some of us ended up playing the Infect deck, the, the deck I played. Uh, basically, we just felt like it was the best deck. I mean, it's kind of a token answer, but, you know, people, some people say, I like this kind of deck, I like that kind of deck. But ultimately, when you're going to the Pro Tour, you just play what you think is going to give you the best chance to win. And we thought it was the Infect deck for this tournament. And do you feel like your gauntlet that you threw that up against is fairly representative of what you've seen in the tournament? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, certainly there's, you know, there's some decks there was just like a blue red Eldrazi deck on camera. We never, we never tried that. Um, there are some decks you don't anticipate, but for the most part, you know, the big decks, Burn, Affinity, uh, are both what we thought would be the highest played decks. And it looks to me, the best I can tell, like the lists we thought people would play are, are pretty close. Okay. Uh, just talk real quickly about draft. Did, did the draft format look, did, did the other players around you behave the way you guys expected the yeah, to play Yeah, I mean, out? it always does. Everybody always thinks, oh, people won't do this at the Pro Tour, people won't do that at the Pro Tour, but everybody does. That's why it's the Pro Tour. Everybody's great, everybody figures stuff out. Um, it's pretty rare where you get to find a spider spawning draft deck or whatever it is, something like that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it, it was pretty standard. I mean, nothing really was surprising about the draft to me. Okay, and then uh, how do you temper expectations going into day two with, with such a good record? I don't. I just really expect, <laughs> you know, I, I guess I should say expectations, whatever. I hope I do well. Um, I don't expect to do well, but, but I hope that, hope that, you know, I hope that I can continue to, to win. What, one last question. I'll let you get out to, to, to the group. Go get some dinner. Well, well deserved. Uh, do you guys go back to the drawing board at all tonight? and go, okay, we've learned these things, what do we know? Like, is there any kind of, like, uh, group think that happens about day one before almost, going into day two? Well, almost certainly tonight at dinner we'll discuss things we could have done, things we could have thought of, how, you know, various people discuss how they sideboarded or strategies they used in certain matchups, but um, we probably won't play any more Magic tonight. It'll probably just be <laughs> eat, relax, and go to bed, get ready for tomorrow. All right, I'm going to let you get to it. For William Jensen, sending it back to Rich Hagar. Thanks so much uh, to Billy for his time and a great job, seven and one overnight. Uh, more interviews on the way in just a moment for you. Um, so let's look at some of the seven and ones. Apart from William Jensen, Louis Scott Vargas is seven and one. Paul Cheon is seven and one. Martin Muller of Denmark, Team Eureka, seven and one. But you note there are plenty of other names, perhaps not quite so well known. Nathaniel Smith of the United States only has one loss. So does Scott Lipp of the United States. Frank Lepore playing in his first pro tour, um, coupled with Melissa de Tora, um, th those two, one of the power couples of magic. Uh, Frank's having a wonderful day, seven and one. Uh, we chatted at one and oh, and he went, ah, oh, just another 15 to go. Well, he's had one loss, but in great shape for a run at the top eight. Emmanuel Gershenson has been terrific on the European Grand Prix scene, the Austrian. He's got two Grand Prix titles from two Grand Prix top eights. He's seven and one. And so is Andrew Brown of the United States. 11-4-1 at Cairns of Tarkir. He opened up 10-6 second time around. This is his fourth Pro Tour. He's really making the most of it again. 7-1. and one. Talking of 7-1, and one, we have three initials for you. And they are L-S-V. I'm here with Luis Scott Vargas, <laughs> Hall of Famer. 7-1 and one, uh, coming out of day one here at the Pro Tour. So earlier we were talking about the genesis of like the modern team situation here at, at the Pro Tour. And we talked about the early days of Channel Fireball. Like when yeah. you guys would just crush a tournament uh, because you were just so far advanced in terms of your preparation and you know, the Squadron Hawk deck or the, uh, the Metal Craft deck. And do you guys feel like, I mean, are you getting a little <laughs> bit of nostalgic flashback yeah. here? Actually, like, so Sam Party, you know, one of the guys on our team sa said today, just after the Swiss, like, this might be the best deck I've ever played at a Pro Tour. And, and my response to him was like, I don't think it's the best deck that I've ever played or any of the guys who played Cobblade, but it might be second, which is insane. Because <laughs> comparing something to Cobblade, you're already in really good company. Yeah. So what, what was the what was the genesis of this deck? Like, how, where, when, at what stage in the playtesting process did you guys come across this deck? Well. I have to be completely honest. Uh, the Denver crew, this is like me, Josh Adder Layton, Matt Nass, Michael Jacob, plus uh, Paul Chan and David Ochoa. We didn't go to Vancouver 
to play in the GP or to test in the house. So you really have to give all the credit to the guys in the house. Like, it, you know, Jacob Wilson came up with like a prototype of this deck. Sam Party, Nathan Holiday, Mike Segrist, uh, T Paulo, tons of other guys. I, I don't even try to name them all because yeah. I'll fail. Those are the guys who really came up with the deck. So I have to give them credit because the deck's awesome. I mean, maybe we helped them the last couple slots. Maybe we, <laughs> you know, were served as testing dummies. But it was a, it was a collective view. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is kind of how teams should work. In my in my mind. If everyone works on different decks, even if you don't play five of those decks, those people still did good work because maybe the next time you'll play one of the decks they worked yeah. on. As it turned out, this Eldrazi deck was really good. How, how uh, shocked were you when you realized that I think it's 17 out of 20 people across the well, collaborative two teams are playing the same deck in modern? That, that's a really big deal because uh, I don't think I've ever been on a team where every single person played the same deck. And I'm even including Cobblade, that we had a couple dissenters. Like, when you have 17 people, or sorry, 20 people, you're gonna have people different preferences, you're gonna have people with different opinions, and having 17 are, is already like a pretty good verdict. It's like, wow, we actually believe in this deck. Especially since if you look at the cards in the deck, I mean, the deck has a high fail rate compared to other modern decks. You can have hands that can't cast anything even though you have three lands in them. You have seven legendary lands in your deck. Like, for people to, who are risk averse to play a deck like that, it means the deck has to be very special. Uh, so, that, that seven, 17 of 20, I know you guys keep track of how the deck's performing. What's the overall performance rate for the deck? I've got to talk to John Stern. He has his notepad. He actually has like a, a grid laid out with every single person on the team in every single round, and he like marks down the wins or losses. Then with a little subscript if it's a team win, because you, you, a team win or loss. So like I know we went 39 and 15 in limited, for example. Okay. I don't know our overall record yet with the Eldrazi deck. We'll have those numbers out tonight, I, I'm I, sure. I had heard like 72.5 percent maybe I'm, coming into this round. I believe it. I mean, we had like at least one 5-0, a couple 4-1s, so we had uh, we had a lot of wins. Okay, well, great job this this weekend so far. Hopefully we don't, uh, we see you on Sunday, but maybe not sitting next yeah, to us. Yeah, my, my plan is to, to only only be here, uh, you know, when, when I'm playing in the tournament. So I, I, I'm i going to try my best to avoid working with you guys. All right, for Luis <laughs> Vargas, sending it back to Rich. Thanks very much. Well, we hope he does get to not work with us uh, on Sunday. Uh, now, I have pieces of paper here. Uh, they say standings after round eight. And according to my script here, if it says standings after round eight, it must be time for the end of day wrap.